Okay, there we go. Hello everyone, how's it going? Team here and this is BXGS Weekly episode 17 from uh, 30th of June. Is it still June? Yes, it is still June. There we go, 30th of June. So we got um, some stuff today. I mean, this week there's not that much for whatever reason. I guess, you know, summer and vacations and all that kind of stuff is going on around. So, but we do have some interesting things. So as you can see here, we got a bunch of articles, not that many releases and uh, few demos and libraries and some silly stuff that I hope you will like because I personally found it to be absolutely hilarious. But um, I guess let's just jump right into the articles and news, shall we? The first thing we got is the pretty lengthy article on um, assessing loading performance in real life with navigation and resource timing from Google guys, uh, published on Web Fundamentals, the resource that I've uh, highlighted more than once already. And uh, it actually shows off some of the browser APIs that I didn't personally know even existed. So there's stuff like navigation timing and resource timing, the uh, window.performance get entries, which um, I personally, as I said, I didn't even know that stuff existed, but apparently it does. And you can get some pretty cool insights into the page loading and DNS lookups, connections, request responses, and all that kind of stuff. So if you're heavily interested in performance, or maybe you just want to get into it, and you want to profile your website on uh, live deployments, I guess this is the main target, uh, main reason. Bef um, God damn it, let me try this again. I guess this is the main reason for those API existence, right? Because you can literally run them uh, on client side in JavaScript and a deployed website on your client's browsers and get that uh, performance data to analyze and to know how your website performs in the real world. So it's really, really cool. And it's a pretty detailed write up as usual on Web Fundamentals. All right, continuing, we got headless user interface components, you might be going like, wait a second, yeah, that's exactly that's the first um, sentence that sums it up pretty well. Wait a second, are you advocating a user interface pattern that doesn't have a user interface? And yep, this is pretty much what the article is about is I think it's a really, really cool idea. So um, this example is a coin flip component, which right, you just have a coin flip. In this case, I think it's basically react, right? So and the problem is, okay, you throw a coin math random, if it's less than 0 0.5, it's heads, otherwise, it's tails, right? So quite simple. But then you go, okay, I want to add an image, right? So you add the image tags, and then you go, okay, I want to add labels that I maybe want to hide. So you add this bit with labels. And then you go into, okay, maybe, and there's like someone files a request, like, can you add a button, right, that flips the coin? So you go, okay, now we make it even more complicated. And, um, we just need a new, yeah, that, that, then it goes like, okay, we need a dice roll with, uh, dice instead of coins, so it will be a bit more complicated logic. So it's like, okay, you know, we could actually abstract it into one headless component that would basically do all of that, right. And that's the again, example with a coin flip. So it would be a component that uses the render props. And um, basically just passes the rerun function and is heads uh, result, right. So very simple. And then you can also pass the flip function that would basically change the behavior. So in this case, it's flip, it can be a dice roll or whatever the hell you want, right? So, so you just yeah, you just say run, and then you go there you go. So it's uh, really cool. I mean, I guess you could even probably do that, not as a state, but as a prop for it. But I don't know, like I uh, have probably some good reasoning for not doing that. But yeah, it is a really interesting uh, approach to the UIs, you know, like headless UIs, at least for the logic bit. And again, render props striking back. So it's really cool. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, do have a look at the article, it is a pretty good write up and uh, has some really cool ideas. All right, continuing, we got building better compression together with div ends. And I probably forgot to allow all the JavaScript. So we're not going to see half of the things that are on the page here. So um, the divans is the compression algorithm from uh, Dropbox guys. Why I'm highlighting this on JavaScript podcast is because they written the whole thing in Rust. So there is da -da 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 -da, wait a second, you might guess what I'm leading to. So yes, is written in Rust, which means you can compile it to WebAssembly, which means you can just uh, 
take it and run it right in a browser. And they have a link to the demo. They also have like a bunch of comparison with Brotly and other uh, com uh, compression algorithms, which seems to be like, you know, they seem to be performing quite significantly better. Uh, but that's not the whole point. The whole point is that you can have a, there's a demo link, where the hell is it? There we go. Um, that runs in the browser that shows you all the steps and shows you the savings and so on and so forth. You can throw in your files and all of that is working right in the browser via WebAssembly, which is pretty mind blowing if you ask me. I mean, just look at this stuff. You literally have compression algorithm running in your browser via WebAssembly written in Rust, which, you know, and allows you to change the quality and everything. So you can basically tweak it as you go, which is kind of crazy. But uh, yeah, it's really cool. It's also open source. So you can, you know, if you're interested, you can have a look at the source code um, right on a GitHub, I believe. Yeah, there are even a link for the pull request. So if that's your cup of tea to have a look, it looks really, really cool. Again, written in Rust and uh, possible uh, with possible compilation to WebAssembly. I think there's, yeah, there's, again, the example that uh, they run. So you can even have a look at that. Right, continuing, we got threads in Node 10.5, a practical intro. This is exactly as Dial says, introduction to new worker threads that are currently experimental in Node version 10.5. Um, very basic write-up, but gives you all you want to know about the threads um, with code samples and, you know, using the threads and everything, doing something. So not just uh, example in vacuum, but actually doing something. In this case, I believe they sort the list exactly. And uh, yeah, so it's like, I mean, you know, it's nothing complicated, but it's a pretty good introduction. Uh, if you... If you're interested in worker threads, do have a look at this. I also should mention this is a shameless plug. I did a video and a stream on it this week. So if you are more inclined to uh, watching videos than reading blogs, then there's a video on my YouTube channel. You can go ahead and watch that. We did um, threads, you know, threaded version of uh, Factorial, which turned out to be at some point worse than one threaded because, you know, Obviously, the, if you just click create a simple factorial, spawning all those worker threads would be overhead. But once you get to the certain number, it starts getting way faster. So it's pretty cool. Okay, continuing. We got our vision for Rust and WebAssembly. This is a write-up from the um, Mozilla guys, essentially, the, the team behind the Rust, and their thoughts on how the Rust and WebAssembly align to each other, basically, right? So... Uh, they do not want to rewrite anything. They want to integrate Rust into WebAssembly. They want to keep the workflow that is familiar to you. They also outline the current status, point to some tools that are currently available, including the Vasm bind gen that we talked about, including the Vasm pack that we talked about, and all that kind of stuff. So if you're looking to get into low-level development with WebAssembly and you're looking uh, into Rust as well, that this is a pretty good starting point that... Mm, basically talks about the current state and uh, what can you currently do, what tools are available and how do you do that. Uh, there's plenty of links to tutorials in here actually. All right, continuing we got, uh, yes, we got the testing Firefox monitor, new security tool. So um, I think I've speaked at some point about it, but there is an amazing tool by uh, Troy Hans that is called haveibeenpounds.com. And essentially you just put in your email address and you see all the breaches that you have been in, right? So if I put my in, I will see like a ton of things that have been breached like Adobe account this is in 2013, um, Gmail dump, I, yeah, it was like also 2014, CD Projekt Red, their forum and so on. So I could, there's a ton of breaches here, right? And the cool thing is that this um, the service it not just tells you hey your your account has been breached but you can also subscribe and it will actually send you an email once the new breach pops up and it's absolutely free so you can donate obviously and uh, now they started integrating the service into various things including like password managers and now Firefox so uh, when you connect when you manage your Firefox account it will actually start using the Firefox monitor, their new service, to notify you about possible breaches, which will be pretty awesome if you ask me. Like, I really like this kind of uh, integrated security with just about any of my accounts. Unfortunately, LastPass, the manager that I currently use, still have not added that. I mean, they do have their own tool, but I don't actually know if that's uh, based on have I been pawned or not. Uh, I 
Probably it is, right? Because it's very similar. It has, it has a very similar timing to uh, have I been pawned, at least from their emails, but whatever. That's not the news here. But uh, yeah, still really cool to see Firefox integrating stuff like this to keep users notified. Okay, continuing. We got a building a tabs component with React. I believe I blocked some JavaScript here as well. So let me just unblock it real quick. And uh, this is exactly what the uh, what the title says. It is a tutorial on how to build a tabs component in React. Pretty simple one, like there is no fancy animations, transitions or whatnot, but it does give you a very solid foundation and understanding on how do you actually do the tabs component, right? So. You got all your tabs, you got the nested uh, divs, and this is what's going to be um, working, right? So pretty simple, but a very good introduction to uh, sort of toggleable elements in React, I guess. Tabs, right? All right, continuing, we got ad hoc unit testing in Node.js, an article from Dev2, pretty amazing community. If you are still not there, then I highly recommend it. But uh, let's get back to the article itself. The ad hoc unit testing in Node.js is an article, well, that is essentially an experience of a person who was like, well, you know what? I don't really need to test the whole app right now because I don't know what it's gonna be and the functionality is not set, which is at least for me, very relatable. I do a lot of things like this, but there is this one little function that converts this array into this array and I wanna test it, but I don't wanna bring a third party framework. There's also a video if you're more into a video watching than reading, but uh, there's an article too. So uh, what this article essentially talks about is that how do you write your own unit testing framework? This is what it boils down to. So for whatever reason, the author decided that it's better to write his own framework than just take something small and existing. So, but uh, uh, you know, I won't discuss the, <laughs> the sort of implications of that. I would actually take something existing, but it's still a really good write up on how the, uh, that will basically allow you to understand how the testing frameworks work. How do you actually write one and how do you do everything that basically basic testing framework needs to do, right? You know, the assertions and tests and test running and all that kind of stuff. So it's pretty good. Uh, if you ever wondered how the testing frameworks work, then this could be a pretty good introduction. Um, also, there are some thoughts from author on what he did, why he did, and would he do that again? That's a really, yeah, there's some interesting discussion in here. So be sure to read that uh, even if you're not interested in writing your own testing framework. Right, continuing, we got uh, creative inclusive apps using React Native. This is essentially um, everything about React Native accessibility. The topic that actually somehow evaded me um, all these years. Also, you know, I haven't actually written any commercial React Native apps, let's put it this way. So the ones that have been used by thousands of people. Um, the interesting thing is that, you know, accessibility is a very, um, how do you put it, very fine topic, right? So it's not something that you can just jump in and do right away because there are some tricky things about it because there's a lot of types of accessibility and you do have to know a lot of things about it, right? So. Turns out that React Native actually provides you quite a lot of um, accessibility tools like accessible and accessibility label flags that you can just add and they will be available for like screen readers and stuff like this, which I didn't know, but you know, again, I didn't really work with accessibility in React Native that much, but uh, so if you are working on a commercial app that will be used by thousands of users and you are looking into accessibility, which you should be doing, definitely do have a look. This article gives an incredible introduction to the whole um, accessibility parameters, labels, traits, component types, and so on and so forth. So it is really cool to see uh, what you can do, how do you actually debug? There's turns out there's OSX Accessibility Inspector, for example, that I didn't know existed. So there's also some gotchas here and some other interesting things. So definitely do have a look if you're working with a React Native and uh, mobile development. Right, continuing, we got managing state in Vue.js. Um, essentially a very lengthy write-up on general state management and possible approaches to state management in Vue apps, which not to say that the those approaches are view specific or view exclusive, this is the better way to put it, 
but um, they are, you know, sort of the state approaches that you currently have with some view specific implementations. This is the way to put it. So even if you are not using Vue.js, it still would be interesting to read through this because there are some, um, you know, it basically goes from simple to more complex, starting from props and custom events where you just do it yourself, which is not very efficient, but it works. And sometimes that's enough. And going to the, um, yeah, so the problem pops up. How do you communicate with, uh, how do two children communicate because they don't pass props around. So go into event bus, you set up the event bus and then use this bus to pass the messages around and then go into the uh, global store and go into the UX, which is the de facto library for view uh, state management, right? So it's a pretty sort of uh, laid out journey, how the author came to that and how probably you would come to that if you would start from scratch and start doing it yourself. And also an example on how to use the UX, although, you know, it's a very simple and straightforward uh, library, including pros, cons, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, if you are interested in uh, front end state management, even if you're not working with Vue, that's still very helpful to read through that and to uh, wait out the options. Right, continuing, we got ES6 journey through design patterns. Um, exactly what it says. This is a pretty good write up on uh, design patterns, like typical software design patterns in the, or using JavaScript ES6, including module, factory, observer, adapter, and facade. Um, if you never worked with, or maybe you are not, familiar with those design patterns, or maybe you are familiar, but don't know the names, which I found to be quite common actually among the CS students, which is not a bad thing. You know, I like, I think it took me like five years or something of proper software development to actually read the book on software design patterns to actually learn the names and, and that those things are actually uh, could be described in more formal language. So be, be, before I was like, yeah, something like this. And you know, now I know that you can actually call it a module pattern. But yeah, it's a pretty good introduction that talks about modules, about the factory pattern, how do you produce uh, elements from the factory, the observer pattern, facade and all that kind of stuff. Um, as well, there's like additional um, thoughts about them, I guess, in conclusion. So if you are looking to understand more uh, thought of, at least on a basic level, the design patterns in uh, software engineering that do have a look, if you are interested in learning them in depth, then I would recommend to read a book on that. There is more than one that are really good. Um, if you want any recommendations, you can just ask me on Discord. I can provide that because I don't remember that on top of my head, the names and the uh, name of the author. So I would not just want to talk about that right now. Let's not waste time on this. <laughs> All right, continuing. We got how WebAssembly is accelerating the future of web development. Uh, another article about WebAssembly. So we're gonna, I'm, I'm guessing we're gonna get a lot more of those because sort of WebAssembly is starting to get a lot of steam lately. Um, it basically talks about, you know, is WebAssembly is going to kill JavaScript? What is actually the future of web development? Now uh, there's a really cool link here. So there's a list of implementations uh, of uh, WebAssembly languages. So it's basically a list of languages that compile to WebAssembly. And there's a lot of things here that I didn't know about. Like for example, I didn't know there was an Elixir VASM already because Elixir is a really neat language and I should probably investigate it as because it looks really interesting. There is also interesting things like Haskell Vasm and Kot no, Kotlin native is something I knew about that is not so interesting. Uh, there's apparently Python version of WebAssembly, which is kind of crazy. Includes core packages of scientific Python stack, NumPy, Pun. Whoa, okay, that looks amazing. I have to look at that. So yeah, that's a really cool list. And uh, in general, the article goes through the sort of how the WebAssembly developed, what kind of things are available right now, what could you do with it, and what will it enable in future, how it will develop, which is also quite interesting um, to think about basically. So if you're interested in WebAssembly, do have a look. There's plenty of very interesting links in this article, uh, highly recommend it. Right, continuing, we got building a Twitter clone with Vue.js using zero configuration. Um, everybody seems to be quite crazy about zero configuration lately, although, you know, I would say it's a bit overhyped, but uh, yeah, it's still a decent article that 
walks you through so it's a tutorial as you might imagine of building the view app uh, not even using any command line stuff so just pure script tags and html right which is absolutely fine so you can do that why not state management and all that kind of stuff i believe it's like a three-part article um there should be an episode another so this this was part one but i saw another part somewhere maybe i'm mistaken it with a different article but there's also a code on github available so if you're interested in building your own Twitter or just figuring out how exactly it's built, then do have a look, it's uh, pretty good. Right, continuing, we got creating games with JavaScript, three part article about building your own uh, Flappy Bird in JavaScript. So it says games, but in, in reality, the article talks just about the Flappy Bird, which, you know, obviously you cannot create all the games uh, in three part articles. So they decided to stop, the author decided to stop on the Flappy Bird, which is pretty good. So it uses the Canvas.js and simple Canvas drawing API to just uh, draw the Flappy Bird and all the uh, images essentially. And there's uh, three parts where you build the whole thing. Pretty straightforward. So if you ever wanted to get into uh, developing simple games in JavaScript, then this should be a good start. I'm not sure if it's mobile friendly, actually I haven't checked that. But making Canvas mobile friendly is not too hard. It's supported on the most modern mobile devices. So yeah, it's a good one. Right, continuing, we got uh, use AWS GraphQL for React Native Message App. So this article is, yeah, exactly what it says. It's a tutorial about Amazon Web Services GraphQL service, which I didn't even know existed. But apparently, you know, there's now a hosted GraphQL service that you can just buy from Amazon. And of course there is because it's Amazon Web Services. They literally have hosted everything. So you don't even have to configure it yourself. You literally just buy and push stuff and mutate stuff and then query stuff from it, right? So you don't even have to set up your own database or GraphQL endpoint, you just buy one. That's kind of amazing. And yeah, so it walks you through the, again, AWS setup, which is as usual, non-trivial through the uh, queries and mutations and, and types for your GraphQL schema and then the basic uh, client setup and all that query execution from your mobile client, right? So pretty straightforward, nothing super fancy here. But uh, still, you know, very interesting. And again, I now I know that there is Amazon Web Services GraphQL stuff amazon guys are just doing crazy stuff it's like it's great but you know all right we got something really cool and really insane here uh fast gif parsing on the web using WebAssembly and wafs um again article from dev2 this time around really really cool one um comparing so the, basically what the author did is parse the uh, gif with bunch of libraries and compared the performance from um, native implementations, right? So WAF native and uh, WAF minus 03. I'm not sure what the difference here is actually. I haven't had that much time to read through it yet. And then FastGIF, which is the WAF compiled to WebAssembly and including some job, pure JavaScript implementation like GIFUNC, GIF engine JS, and SuperGIF. As you can see from this bar chart, the VASM implementation is well near native in quite a lot of times, right? So there's this WAF minus uh, 03 or 03 seems to be a bit more performant in most cases, right? But if you compare it with just native WAF, it seems to be on par, you know, okay, it's sometimes a bit slower, but that's kind of expected. But uh, still, this is like significant advantage in terms of uh, parsing and compare it to the pure JavaScript, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. So uh, the article not just compares it, it also goes through the whole process of how do you actually build it yourself from setting up the Emscripten, building a simple demo, and then, you know, actually changing the GIF path or the expected input from the C library to raw bytes, and then sending those raw bytes in HTML to the actual uh, module, right? So it's a bit tricky, but it's really interesting to read through all of this stuff. And obviously the source code, I think it's available on GitHub if I remember correctly. There's a link somewhere, wait, um, GitHub. Yes, there, yeah, okay, no, that's Vavs. Um, 
No, it cannot be. I saw the link somewhere. Fast GIF. Is that the link? Yes, this is the link. Okay, there we go. So there's a link for the project. So if you don't want to do everything from scratch yourself, you can have a look at the GitHub project and just check out how it works, which is also pretty insane. I mean, it's it's really cool that we see more of the projects like this using WebAssembly. It's just really awesome. Um, yeah. All right, continuing. We got a plain in... Uh, what? No, let's try again. A plain English introduction to JSON web tokens, what it is and what it isn't. Uh, you probably by this point, if you have been developing more than a year, you've heard about JSON web tokens, heard that they are bad, you've heard that they are good, you've heard that they are amazing, you've heard that they suck, you've heard that they are insecure or they are super secure. And maybe you still don't know what the hell's going on, right? So maybe you haven't heard about them at all. So this is a really good write up on what the JSON web tokens are what they are used for, how do they work, how you can sign them, protect them, encrypt them, what is the payload, how is uh, the serialization works, and so on and so forth. So there's basically the whole quite in-depth write-up on the whole thing and how you can use it with, for example, Express, using Express Session, right? Or, um, yeah, how do you secure them? How do you sign them? And so on and so forth. This is a pretty good introduction to the JVT if you are unfamiliar with them. Um, and maybe if you, if you are familiar, you will find something new here. All right, continuing, we got using some old obsolete HTML to create a JavaScript free carousel and animations. That's, that's a really crazy one. So I don't know, like, um, if you are just started programming JavaScript, HTML, web, whatever, like, five years ago, I guess, you probably don't know about the marquee tag or marquee element, right? So this is a thing that was everywhere in like 90s. And essentially what it does, it scrolls, scrolls a text like this. That That's literally all it does. So you put something in a marquee like this. Yeah, please don't destroy stuff. And it just scrolls stuff, right? So I thought that's all it did because typically what you had, and oh man, it doesn't let you edit it. Typically what you had in like old, um, I don't know if that still works. Wait, um, does that work actually? No, it doesn't. Oh no, no, it does. No, it doesn't. Okay. Typically what you had in a very old nineties website is the blinking marquee uh, text that was like, you know, brightly colored. It was like running line in the bottom of the screen. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Still was good fun. Well, it turns out marquee tag can be used in a way more creative ways. Like for example, you can do a JavaScript less image carousel with it, which will actually scroll continuously. So there's one thing I didn't know about marquee. So you can actually set a behavior to it, which will alternate. So in this case, you can see it goes left and then it starts going right. So I didn't know you could do that. Um, I mean, the tag is obsolete, so I don't know how i like how much you should use it and if whether I, I doubt it's going to be removed because don't break the web rule is still there, right? But it is supported by pretty much everything, maybe not the old properties, but you know, at least the basic stuff, which is, yeah, coming down to, you know, thinking of more crazy applications with it. Well, you can do this. So this spaceman is actually inside of a marquee tag. So if you're interested of, uh, if you're interested in doing crazy animations using obscure HTML tags, then do have a look at this article. There's some pretty interesting stuff here. And it's quite hilarious, to be honest. All right, continuing, we got ES6 function destructing um, assignment is not a free lunch. It's a pretty in-depth look into the destruction assignments uh, in the function um, constructors or function calls, I guess, right? So you can, you know, the cats, please just wait a second, cats, just go, go. My cats are trying to fight each other right on my table. It's not, not going to go well. Okay, so coming back to JavaScript functions, uh, like they know, we know the name function pattern right now is like, I love this absolutely, right? Because in this case, you never know what the A and B are, right? But in this case, you actually have named function arguments. So um, in reality, it's obviously just an object that is being destructed, right? And this article looks into the V8 bytecodes, how exactly it is done. Cats. Okay, how exactly is it done? What's the generated uh, V8 bytecode looks like? And what's the overhead? Obviously the memory overhead, for example, will be slightly larger because in this case you just have two arguments. 
while in case of named arguments, you actually have an additional object there that is being constructed and then destructed, right? So um, if you're interested in the implications, do have a look at the article. Um, I'll just say that, you know, the difference is not as big as you think it would be. And even though, you know, we just got the destruct, uh, destruction quite recently, the V8 already does a quite incredible job in optimizing for it. All right, continuing, we got web caching explained by buying milk at the supermarket. So exactly what it says, uh, explanation of what the web caching is, what the internet would look without caching and how does the caching actually works explained on, well, buying milk. And I find it to be a pretty great metaphor, actually. So, cats, come on, what? Jesus. Okay, you just go the hell away from here. All right, um, now that little asshole is away from here, let's, let's continue. So if you were confused about the cache, if you're confused about what CDNs are and how all this stuff works, then this is a really cool article that explains all of that in a very simple and understandable metaphor. So uh, yeah, including browser cache by using fridges, which, which is just great if you think about it. This is a really cool metaphor. So yes, highly recommend it. Uh, cats are, no man, cats are just sometimes, they are just, especially this black asshole. Like we have this little black one who we picked up nearly a year ago and he's still small and he's, he never listens to anything. But he's cute as hell, so you know, we forgive him. <laughs> All right, continuing. We got JavaScript, what's new in ECMAScript 2018. So if you didn't know, ECMAScript 2018 just been approved by the TC39. So we actually have the final version of it, final version of specification. And uh, this is what's gonna be included in it. So first of all, we're getting rest spreads uh, for objects. So if you didn't know, it's this stuff uh, until that it was still stage three, I think. So now it's stage four finalized and uh, everything. We are gonna get a synchronous iteration, which is for a weight of, uh, which is also great. So I think it's already in Node and in Chrome, but again, it was like uh, stage three. We are getting promise.finally, which I don't even know if it's implemented anywhere yet. Uh, that's a really good question. So um, I don't know, they don't provide actually, yeah. So it's stage four already obviously now, but uh, it's a bit, I don't remember if they actually shipped it anywhere, but uh, still. Okay, we got some new regex features, including uh, slash s or dot all flag, named capture groups, look behind, which is amazing, and Unicode property escapes, which is also really, really cool. And all of that, you can see all of that in one regular expression right here. And uh, I think there's, yeah, there's like some tweaks to template literals that were accepted as well. And that's basically it. So yes, 2018 is not gonna be large as well. And it seems like, this is what we're basically going to be getting from year to year, like those minor fine grained patches, which I am fine with because this is way faster than all the development of ECMAScript before. <laughs> so, you know, it's great. All right, continuing, we got installable web apps, a practical introduction to progressive web apps with JavaScript and Node.js. Um, just as you imagine, this is a tutorial on how to write your offline first progressive web app using Node.js and uh, service worker and manifest essentially. So this shows you how to create your own service worker, uh, create your own manifest, cache things and make your app installable uh, to desktop as a progressive web app, which is basic. I mean, it has all you need to start. It's not nothing complicated, but in, if you never did it, that's a really good starting point and it lists everything that you have to know at least of the basic things. Uh, sick of all the tutorials. Well, there are usually a lot of tutorials. Sadly, we don't really have that many other articles, I think, but you can write a different article, you know, something about experience, maybe something like this one, for example. The next article we got is doing view after three years of React, a really cool experience right up about, um, yeah, experience essentially of switching from React to Vue.js and seeing what's actually different, right? So what's the difference between Vuex and Redux? How does it work? What are the problems here? What are the problems there? What's the differences? So like, yeah, the major difference highlighted is that Vuex doesn't care about immutability is that, you know, you can just mutate whatever you want and it will all just magically work. But there are some problems related to that that are uh, can be like basically edge cases, right? 
But uh, yeah, if you were looking to switching from React to Vue, then have a look at this write-up. There is some pretty interesting insights here. Um, reading documentation is good. I cannot argue with that. Documentation is always great, especially if it's well written. All right. Um, right, let's continue. I'm just getting distracted by the chat. God damn it. <laughs> All right, on consuming and publishing ES 2015 plus packages. Article from Henry Zhu, who you might know as an, one of the core maintainer of Babel.js, uh, which is the tool that I think most, maybe probably all of you love and know, come on. It's a great tool. And exactly what you imagine, this is a pretty lengthy write-up on publishing and consuming packages that use non-standard syntax and that use Babel to trans or something else maybe to transpile back to the older versions of JavaScript, right? So there's some very interesting thoughts here and very interesting pointers, including stuff like, hey, you know, you probably shouldn't use stage zero or you probably shouldn't use anything that is less than stage three because there are some proposals that have been pushed from stage three to stage two, for example, and some that have been stalled forever like bind operator or object observe or dropped entirely yeah, like object observe or decorators. There's a lot of really cool insights from a person who essentially tracks all of those proposals very closely, right? Because he has to implement them and maintain the Babel functionality to them. So it is highly recommended read if you are looking into work or if you're already working with Babel.js. So there's some really, really cool things here. And also what's basically Babel 7 is going to do about that and how it's going to help with all of these things, which is also really, really cool. I can't wait, honestly, for Babel 7 to be released um, into the stable branch, right? Because right now we have it is beta 11 or whatever was it. It's like 50. Okay, I haven't looked. <laughs> that was, I have looked here a long time ago. It's beta 51. Okay, right. Um, well, okay. Uh, so the next thing we got is exploring ES 2018 and ES 2019 by Dr. Axel Rauschmeier. This is an ebook that you can read for free or purchase in PDF, EPUB, Mobi or whatever if you want or donate if you like it. Essentially, it's uh, similar to exploring JavaScript from him, but just purely looks at the ECMAScript 18 and 19. Uh, this stuff like promise finally so basically all that stuff that is coming out in a new revision right it's all here pretty in depth with examples specs and everything with edge cases so if you're interested in knowing more about that do have a look it's pretty great okay um i think this is like one of the last things yes it is i, I believe the last article we have for today it's nothing super javascript related but i found it pretty cool so i thought i would include it anyway so the Brave browser, the uh, creation of Brandon Ike, um, introduces private tabs that come with Tor. So you can literally, when you start Brave, you have an option to create a new private tab that will be behind Tor just for this tab, which is kind of incredible when you think about it, because that means you have zero setup access to Tor and that means that like it's nearly impossible to track you, you when you use uh, Brave, right? Because they already have uh, like, I mean, I, I have it installed to be honest, because I found it to be pretty um, interesting because they do a quite a lot of really cool things here. Let me just move it right here. And, you know, first of all, they already have like, so if you go to Google, for example, they already have this uh, shields, right? Which protect you from ads or tracking. And uh, third-party cookies, they also protect you from fingerprinting and they also protect you from phishing and malware and all of that just done by the browser. And now if you open a new tab with Tor, that means that there's literally almost no way to track you, which is kind of incredible that, you know, the ease of use is just insane. So it's really, really cool to see something like this basically making it to the masses. Yeah. Um, I thought I would just highlight it. All right, we got releases section and first release being Redux Observable going to the version 1.0, uh, which also means the speed will be slow. Well, yeah, I mean, Tor is notoriously slow. I mean, it's not incredibly slow, but uh, it's basically a question of, you want, do you want to trade speed for privacy or do you want some sort of a middle ground or it's like, it's, it's up to you, right? You don't have to 
have everything in the Tor tabs. That's why it's private tab with Tor. So it's a separate option. But if you want to access something that maybe is blocked by your ISP, like this is a very common problem in Russia now, for example, there's literally a pain in ass to do that stuff. It's like you have to buy VPNs and even some VPNs are being blocked right now. So I have a lot of Russian friends who are like literally fighting their ISPs to access stuff. And just having a button that says, hey, let me access the thing that should be banned is incredible. But okay, coming back to releases, Redux Observable version 1.0, um, coming with RxJS version 6, Redux version 4 support, and that's basically it. And this is, what you see here is a really, really big migration guide that basically walks you through all you have to do to migrate. So it seems to be the mostly about uh, bumping up the dependency versions and making it stable, essentially been in usage for quite some time. And I think there's a lot of people using it in production. So it's a pretty great middleware. And uh, if you are in need of work with uh, observables and reactive environments, then this is a really good one for React and Redux. Right, continuing, we got Firefox 61, which is really cool. So the major highlight of this is a quantum CSS uh, engine that features parallel CSS parsing and retained display list feature. Um, there's also some additional things. So if you're <clears throat> if you're interested to have a look, uh, the also Firefox monitor, but it will be rolled out in stages, so you might not see it. I think they've they've uh, mentioned they will be only only rolling it out to the first 250,000 users or something in the US at first. So uh, yeah, keep your eyes out. It's going to pop up at your Firefox at some point. Right. Uh, if you're more interested in reading the write up from the Firefox guys than the patch notes. Um, do have a look at this post that outlines it and explains a bit more on what the hell's going on. Tor browser recently launched alpha version with Firefox 60. That's that's really cool. I mean, um, I don't know if I would pick Tor browser over the Brave right now because having that simplicity actually defeats the Tor browser for me. But uh, well, let's have a look at that. Why not? So we got Tor browser version 8.0 A9. Okay, I guess that's alpha nine, right? Firefox 60, which is pretty neat. So they are just one version behind the actual Firefox. Includes HTTPS everywhere and no script. That sounds pretty amazing, actually. So if you want all in one and don't really want to brave, but want your own Firefox or maybe a false software, then this is your choice. That looks really cool. Thank you for sharing this. All right, continuing, we got uh, DocZ version 0.3.2, the uh, library that I highlighted a couple of podcasts ago for writing the documentation. They've now added the dark mode that you can change on the fly just with the config. There's a video right here. It's going to show you just set the mode to dark and there's a hot reload does the magic and you just see the dark theme, which is pretty neat. Um, These themes are also now mobile friendly and you can now also use your own logo, which is pretty great too. So if you're looking for the next just like experience for docs, do have a look at that. Okay, um, Twitter, what are you doing? There we go. Right, the last release we got here is Golang version 111 beta one. And you might be going like, why is this in JavaScript podcast? Well, I will tell you why, because Golang 111 includes a uh, WebAssembly target. So you can now actually take Golang library and compile it to WebAssembly and then ship it to the browser and run it from within JavaScript. Um, where is the go doc? I think this is the go doc. No, this is the go commands. Was it this one? Yeah, there we go. There's the release notes and uh, WebAssembly. There we go. So, um, the thing is, they implemented literally everything from the Golang in WebAssembly, including Go routines, garbage collection, and all that kind of stuff. From what I read, the performance is not yet quite that good because the WebAssembly doesn't have a go-to instruction, so they had to work around that. And they are now basically pressuring the WebAssembly committee to include the go-to, which would be actually amazing if they would do that. But we're going to see how that develops. Anyway. It's really cool to see that it's already in Golang. It's already working. There are already people playing around with it. And what I'm actually planning is uh, next Wednesday or this this upcoming Wednesday, which is going to be what, uh, like third, fourth of July. I'm going to have a live stream uh, at my usual time where I am going to be uh, using Golang to build a WebAssembly module and then run it in a browser. 
I thought go to was a mistake from eloquent JS. Well, that's a go to in JavaScript, right? We're talking about go to in WebAssembly. So go to in assembly languages works significantly different to the way it works in the C JavaScript or whatever. So it's it's a it's slightly different thing basically. We're not talking about JavaScript here. Okay, continuing, we got uh, our libraries and demos section where essentially, I mean, again, there's not that much stuff this week, I apologize, but you know, can't really do anything to it. So the first thing we got is does it mutate.xyz, a website that tells you if any of the array methods mutate the array, something that I keep forgetting and I keep screwing up from time to time. This gives you a pretty good thing. So for example, concat does not mutate the array while copy within does mutate the original array. So you have to be careful with that. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty neat reference that just tells you if the method of array mutates it or not. Oh, God damn it, the mosquito. Okay. Continuing, we got React from Zero, a really cool uh, repo that contains a tutorial. Well, it says it's a really simple tutorial, but it's actually not that simple, but really good tutorial, really in-depth tutorial for React uh, from Zero to basically everything you need to know, starting from object elements, element factory, JSX, nested components, properties, examples, nested components, uh, life cycle, basically whatever you need to know about React, it's all in here, including the previews, including the full comments, and it's also available in Chinese if that's your thing. So it is a pretty great one and highly recommended if you are getting into React or maybe if you just want to have a look at the more advanced um, lessons, right? Okay, next thing we got is Oletus. Uh, I, I, I think it's a Finnish word, at least this is what I remember from Twitter discussion, but uh, I have no idea how to read it in Finnish properly, so I'm just gonna read it as Oletus, and I apologies. Apologies to all the Finnish, Finnish viewers. <laughs> all right, uh, it's a minimal ECMAScript module test runner, and it's made to work with, um, what do you call it? ESM, right. So the ESM package that supports the modules, uh, ES modules, right? The, you just do this and then you can write very simple tests and use them with uh, import syntax and JS modules. All that us. Okay, so this is how you read it. Okay, all that us. Okay, sure, sounds fun. Uh, sounds uh, simple enough. <laughs> okay. Right, let us continue. Uh, we got the Just API, the specification based API test framework for HTTP APIs, REST and GraphQL. So you might imagine is a test framework that is specification based instead of just, you know, writing tests, you actually write the specs and then you can execute those specs against your API and test them this way, right? So this, um, I, I guess it's gonna be Swagger specification, right? Because this is what everyone uses. That does look like Swagger specification. So if you were looking to turn your Swagger specification into a unit test for your endpoint, then this might be a um, thing to look at. Looks pretty neat. Doesn't seem to mention Swagger anywhere. No, actually, is it? I mean, that looks a lot like Swagger, but I cannot say if it's, if it's a Swagger or not. Maybe it's just some derivation of Swagger uh, YAML files, but whatever. Okay. Continuing, we got React Big Calendar, uh, Google Calendar slash Outlook like calendar for React. It is very fancy. It is like, you, there's a lot of things you can do with it. Like literally, this is all one component. And as you can see here, there's like tons of things you can do, including locales, including pop-ups for things like this including time slots, including custom rendering if you want to, including drag and drop where you can actually drag stuff around. And all of that in one component that seems to be pretty well written with unit tests and everything. So yeah, if you were looking for a calendar, it does works only on IE 10 plus. So, you know, too bad if you um, need it for like older browsers, but I hope you really don't have to work for EA 9 or older. <laughs> it's just painful. So yes, a really good calendar for React. Okay, next thing we got is broadcast channel. Uh, broadcast channel that works in basically everywhere. So the idea is that this is a sort of message bus, I guess, right? You create a broadcast channel, you create a named broadcast channel, and then you just post a message and you can listen to it 
in the uh, another tab process and whatnot. So it seems to be using quite a lot of things in the background. It also seems to work between the web workers and things like this. I have not checked the underlinings of it, how it works exactly and whatnot, but it seems to be pretty simple, right? So if you needed uh, something like this to have a look, seems to be pretty good. Right, continuing, we got super fine, minimal view layer for creating declarative web user interfaces. And by minimal, they mean like one kilobyte of size, gzipped, and it is literally like a vidom uh, implementation, something similar to Inferno or, you know, all those kind of vidom libraries. Seems to be pretty simple. So if you looked for another vidom implementation that is small and fast, then do have a look at this one. Maybe this is your thing. Again, I always, uh, kind of vary of those and think like, why would I pick that over Preact, for example, right? Because Preact has a way bigger user base and you can also use it in the same way. So I'm like, I don't know. Maybe that's your thing, just have a look. Okay, continuing, we got GeoJS, a declarative 3D globe data visualization library built using 3JS and it looks damn fancy. So this is the thing you can do with it. And I think there was a demos on their website. Um, the uh, JavaScript is not blocked. There we go. This is the live demo. It was on the website and this is what you can do. And it's literally, you just, you know, add the data points in the, um, oh man, I almost, I keep forgetting how this geolocation, uh, and geolocation based format is called, but basically it's a standard format for this kind of data. And you just literally add it there and it works, which looks, looks really fancy. So if you looked for something like this for a visualization on a globe, do have a look. Looks pretty great. All right, and the last thing we got is, uh, let me just enable JavaScript, is devtube, uh, dev.tube, a website that collects uh, videos related to software development uh, and allows you to filter them by text, by speakers, by channels, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, also searching for whatever you, prefer to, right? So there's a JavaScript tag, for example, you can do that and then remove the JavaScript. And then maybe you want JavaScript and performance, so you can do that. So uh, if you are, you know, consuming videos a lot, do have a look, maybe you'll find something cool here. I'm not sure how exactly they scrape those videos, how they collect them, how they collect the channels. Uh, but seems to have quite a lot of videos here, actually. So maybe you'll find something good. All right, and the last thing we got is Instagram Lite. So there's been, uh, I found it to be quite hilarious. So there's been news about, hey, Instagram Lite launched on Google Play Store. And look, it's just uh, 473 kilobytes of size. I was like, that sounds fishy. And I started digging around and turns out that Instagram Lite is actually a progressive web app. So if we go to the Instagram page, for whatever reason, they did not launch it for desktops, but if you, switch into the mobile device like iPhone X or I don't know, Pixel 2 XL, whatever, you refresh the page, you will actually see the familiar Instagram page. And this is actually a progressive web app that has everything, including posting photos, All right, If you take your photo, like there are filters, obviously it's not gonna be as fancy as on the mobile, so you don't have the fine grained controls over that but it actually still works. You can post photos, you can have a look at, at the feed, you can comment, you can look at the profiles, you can like photos, you can do whatever the hell you want and it is web app. You can just install it from your browser and it's gonna be 500 kilobytes. Probably even less because those 500 kilobytes on the, um, on the Play Store actually included the, oh, what do you call it? Oh man, I forgot the name of it. The web view around it, right? So it's like Cordova or whatever. So in your browser, it's probably gonna be like 100 kilobytes or whatever. I can actually check it probably, right? Should be like application and uh, and if has, there a size metric somewhere, there should be, right? Service worker, ah, oh, there we go, 54 kilobytes. There you go, excluding images, obviously. <laughs> so it is incredibly tiny. All right, and uh, the last silly thing we have today is called PTR, which is a preset for Prettier, which looks like this. It's a coin flip preset that will change your settings every time you run it, which is kind of looks, it's, it's painful to even look at this, but just, just, 
I don't know. I think at some point I'm just going to throw it into some project and then look, people try to send pull requests. <laughs> because <laughs> this stuff is just incredibly stupid. <laughs> just great. I think it's amazing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just can't. Like, this is, this is just, yeah. Again, coin flip component coming in to save us all. <laughs> All right, that's basically it from my side. I don't think I have anything else to say here for today. It's been a relatively short episode. I mean, we don't really have that much stuff today, but hey, you know, we got some jiggles and we got a lot of WebAssembly goodness. Uh, so guys, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat right now. If you have any cool links or projects that you worked on yourself, feel free to share them as well. We'll be more than happy to look at them. If you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to ask questions in the comments and usual, uh, we'll be more than happy to answer. There's also our Discord server where everyone is more than welcome to join. I will, um, you know, we, there's a lot of people who will be able to answer the questions you might have to help you with uh, projects that you do, maybe help you with some JavaScript code and stuff. Scuttlebot, yes, I do know Scuttlebot. Hey, Indesh, uh, how's it going? Do you have any questions or any things you want to share? Scuttlebot and Z. I've heard about this Scuttlebot uh, decentralized Twitter, essentially, right? This is what it was pitched as. I have not tried it myself because it sounds like a lot of pain in ass to set it up. <laughs> but the whole like peer-to-peer -peer systems are very exciting area. Well, well, I mean, the stream is nearly ending actually. So we're just discussing the content that the viewers have because I went through the whole podcast already. Uh, but uh, yeah, so coming back to Scuttlebots, uh, I think the whole peer-to-peer -peer internet is really cool and exciting. The problem I have with it is that 90% of time it is a pain in ass to set this whole thing up, right? So the last thing I tried was the Mastodon and it's really cool, like it's really neat, right? So we have this like shards and everything, it's quite easy to set up, it's very similar to Twitter. The problem is if you want to follow someone, it takes so much, like, how do you discover things? There is this, again, the problem with discovery, right? So the centralized discovery was kind of solved, I guess, right? So when you go to Twitter or when you go to YouTube, you get those algorithms, which can be quite terrible from time to time. They can recommend you garbage, but they do work, right? So you sometimes get interesting things. And this is what I want. Sometimes it's okay for me for now at least, right? So again, on Twitter, sometimes I get some good things. I get some recommendations. There's the who to follow that sometimes show me someone good. Like if I am on Mastodon, yeah, but that's the thing, right? It just gives you the global timeline. Like there's so much stuff happening in global timeline I don't care about, right? Twitter gives me actual suggestions. So like they know I follow a lot of gaming guys. So it suggests me to follow the Polygon, which I will never follow. But hey, you know, that's close enough. They know I follow a lot of software development. So they suggest me to follow JetBrains, which makes sense. And that's like the thing is that in federated and distributed and peer-to-peer -peer networks, it is really hard to actually do something like this. And uh, I know that, that like we, we had like in our research group, we have guys who were working on peer-to-peer -peer networks on distributed networks. And the recommendations problem there is just incredibly hard. I don't even know if there are any, any like proper solutions to it even in the academia world. So, but again, you know, this is not my area. So I might be wrong. There's only like 20 solutions out there. But what I'm saying is um, it's really cool, but unless all of this, Scuttlebot and Mastodon and whatnot becomes more convenient, nobody will ever use it. It's like beyond the enthusiasts who really like it, right? I know that there is always will be like small community of really committed people who will be using it daily. And this is great, don't get me wrong. It's amazing that people keep pushing it and keep developing it. And at some point I'm hoping it will break this barrier of usefulness, but right now it is just too much pain in the ass. That's that's basically my thoughts as a very lazy person about it, right? Okay, do you guys have anything else you want to discuss or shall we wrap it up here for today? Uh, meanwhile, let me think. Do I, do I have anything else myself? I don't want to stream from my phone. I want my remote control. All right, uh, and some random hardware OS related questions. Um, 
I mean, Indesh, you can join our Discord chat. We can talk there. There's a lot of people who can help you as well, uh, as well with the hardware nurse related questions. The stream, I would prefer to keep it JS related because I'm publishing it on uh, YouTube later on. So I would want this to be a JavaScript podcast. All right, seems like it's a wrap up then. So no more uh, things to discuss. Uh, thank you guys very much for watching. As usual, you can find all the links on GitHub with uh, Link should be in a channel description on Twitch and it should be in a description in the YouTube video if you're watching this on YouTube. As usual, thank you very much for watching. Do send me over your cool projects and your cool links in GitHub, Twitter, Discord, whatever the hell you like. I will, bleh, let me try that again. <laughs> I'll be more than happy to read through and look through your projects and uh, show them off on this podcast because come on, that's really cool. And so it's cool to have more new things. But yeah, uh, thank you for watching. Have an awesome rest of the weekend and I see you next time. Bye.